What's going on guys, it's Alan here, and today I have you guys a mystery, but not just any mystery, but a case that took the nation by storm, which was the Chicago Tylenol killings. This is the case of an animal man or woman that planted poison Tylenol pills on bottles and killed 7 people. As a matter of fact, this case is the reason why there are now tamper proof seals on bottles. This shows how much of an impact a case like this was because... For all they knew, this could have been like the next epidemic, like the one we have right now, but it was just a bunch of poison pills. And now I'm just going to share all the details with you guys. That's enough of the intro, now let's just get into the timeline. Okay, so the timeline started on September 29th, 1982. Seven people in, Seven people in just a poison time and no pills then died. The names of those people were Mary Kellerman at age 12. Mary Reiner at age 27, Mary McFarland at age 31, Paula Prince at age 35, Adam Janus at age 27, Sandy Janus at age 25, and Theresa Janus at age 19. One of the Januses passed out after ingesting extra strength Tylenol, then died in the hospital soon. The rest of the siblings will die as well. Alright, so it doesn't really take a genius to know that probably something in the house killed them because three members of the same family died in the same day. So the investigators started to look around in their house. And they found something interesting. When the investigators searched the victim's bathroom, they found a bottle of Tylenol that actually shared the same control number, MC2880, with another bottle that belonged to another victim. That's not all the investigators noticed. When they smelled the inside of the bottles, it smelled a bit like almonds, which is interesting because cyanide smells like almonds so what do we know so far well what we know is that um, probably the person who did this has some kind of MO of using um, some kind of poison like cyanide on October 1st 1982 with the evidence that the investigators had so far they were convinced that the bottles were intentionally poisoned which means that somebody wanted blood in their hands and it was not some kind of accident and to make things worse, the investigators found out that the victims bought their bottles in different stores on different locations. After analyzing hundreds of bottles of Tylenol and coming across a couple of bottles that were tampered, they still haven't managed to find any DNA evidence. They investigated the workers in the stores or pharmacies, former inmates that recently were released from prison, shoplifters, and came across the serial leads in the investigation which is crazy to me. Theories that the investigators had was that the person responsible for this had to go to the store, buy the Tylenol, place the poison on the bottles, then go back to the store, return the bottles, and all that had to be done in a day before the killings. That's because the cyanide would have dissolved through the capsules. A crown with such steps had to leave a trail behind. Yet there wasn't one to follow. Even though it seemed hopeless, the investigators did come across a couple of theories or suspects. So now let's go over them. Alright, so the suspect number one was Roger Arnold. He mentioned some shady shit about the Tylenol killings then was questioned by the police and they searched his home. Later they found out a couple of things. He worked at a jewel Oscar with the father of one of the victims. And to add on to that, the other victim purchased a bottle of Tylenol from that same Jewel Osco. And also, Roger's wife works at like across the street from um, where another victim purchased their bottle of Tylenol. So you can kind of see the, the little connections right there. In Roger's house, there was also manuals of how to do crime. Evidence of Roger doing chemistry was found as well. But they didn't find any cyanide, unfortunately. He refused to take a lie detector test for some reason. Roger shot and killed a man. Later, Roger was sentenced to 30 years. All the evidence was just circumstantial, but they needed physical evidence to prove that he did it, which they had. They didn't have any. All right, let's move on to the second suspect. Um, you guys probably heard of him. Um, his name is Theodore J. Kaczynski. Probably you guys recognize him as the unit bomber. Um, well, the evidence that states is that the evidence that they had for him was that he was a serial bomber or terrorist. Um, currently, he's serving life in prison for killing three people and wounding 23 others by mailing bombs made out of wood. Um, later, I'm going to tell you guys why 
that detail is important. The first bomb was in Chicago and all seven killings were within Illinois. Some victims had connection to wood. Um, let's see. Um, one of the surviving victims of the poison tunnel was named Percy Woods, which um, and he also resided in Lake Forest, Illinois. Another victim was president of the California Forestry Association. His bombs were partially made out of wood, and. <clears throat> And two of the three founders of Johnson & Johnson, which was the company above um, Tylenol, like they kind of own Tylenol. Um, yeah, yeah, they did. Um, so, so yeah, and so, um, so both Johnson & Johnson, they shared the middle name Wood, uh, which I don't know, honestly. That was that's not much evidence to convict them. Um, again, most evidence was again most evidence was circumstantial. Um, um, there was there wasn't really any like there wasn't really any physical evidence either. They just it was just kind of a theory from the officers. I just don't think someone like the Unabomber would have broken his MO to just to um kill other people and if anything he could just like send bombs if he had like a specific target not just like plant a bunch of pills and hope for someone to take the baits and kill them so now we're getting to the prime suspect which was James Lewis Johnson and Johnson received a letter from him a week after the murders there were fingerprints of James Lewis on the letter and also let me read you guys the letter Gentlemen, as you can see, it is easy to place cyanide, both potassium and sodium, into capsules sitting in store shelves. And since the cyanide is inside the gelatin, it is easy to buy buyers to swallow bitter pills. Another beauty I, I can read. Another beauty is that cyanide operates quickly. It takes so very little and there will be no time to take countermeasures. If you don't mind the publicity of these little capsules, then do nothing. So far, I haven't spent less than $50, and it takes me less than 10 minutes per bottle. If you want to stop the killings, wire $1 million to bank account 84-49-597 at, at Continental Illinois Bank, Chicago, Illinois. Don't attempt to involve the FBI or local Chicago authorities with the with the letter. A couple of phone calls by me will undo nothing you can possibly do. Uh, this does not look good on him. But you'll see later why he got scot free. In 1966, he was sent to a mental hospital after taking 36 anison pills and diagnosed with catatonic schizophrenia. Then he fled to Chicago in 1981 under an alias for about a year. He, he also published a book called Poison, The Doctor's Dilemma. And after all that shit, the bank account listed on the letter was not his. It belonged to a man that James believed stiffed his wife out of $511, hoping that the letter would expose the man and had nothing to do with the case. He also bought tickets to New York and Chicago on September 4th, 1982, 25 days before the murder. And remember that the killer had to place the pills in sh And remember that the killer had to place the pills in a short time before the deaths and 25 days was too long. But there is a possibility that he could have flown to O'Hare Airport, then went to the stores to place the bottles and leave Chicago. Alright, so now all right, so now let's get to my theory. If I'm going to be honest, I wouldn't be able to tell you which one of those three guys did it. All three of them had circumstantial evidence, and the only piece of physical evidence that they had against Lewis was pretty much useless. If I'm going to be honest, probably some guy woke up and just felt like committing the perfect crime, and then he just flew to Chicago, planted the pills, and then just like left. Um, to me, that doesn't seem that crazy because it was the fucking 80s. Like, 
to um the 80s was basically the perch but instead of like one night a year it was like 24 24 hours a day 365 days a year um like honestly like if i looked up all the cases that i that i'm gonna go through th in this channel um probably most of them if not all of them are gonna be either in the 80s or before the 80s um it was just a good time to be criminal oh but yeah, that's all I have for you guys today. Um, I want to tell you guys that I'm planning to do these uh, at least once a month. Um, it's just, um, these videos take a lot of time and research. But don't worry, because next time I'm going to do another case that was in Chicago. So don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll see you guys on the next one. I'm out.